be speaking about the shofar tonight. And those of you who've heard me speak before know that I, I, I sort of like write like a paper about something. It's not like an off the cuff speech. It's like writing a paper. And um, I, I'm sorry that it makes it sound more like it's a, like a class from a course you're taking because of course, Judaism is not a course. Judaism is a way of life and um, it's our way of life, but it's, it's just the way that works for me. So I, I'm sorry, and Bensi's gonna help me with it. And um, I'm gonna say it tonight, this talk about the show for tonight. Maybe it's 5% of what I could have spoken about, maybe five, but um, at least I think it will give everyone a feeling um, and maybe some, and hopefully some new ideas. Um, when they hear the shofar, to what to think about. Um, it should be in the schut, in the merit of a refuah shleima, a full recovery for a lot of people in our community who are sick, who need a refuah shleima. Okay, so now I'll start. Jeff Kligger, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, said in an article in the New York Times in September of last year, if there's an artifact that symbolizes the Jewish soul, you'd be hard pressed to find something more indicative than a shofar. In the weekday Amida, the Shemona Esrei, which is recited three times a day, six times a week, or 18 times a week, we say the paragraph that starts with Tikha Bish Shofar, um, which translates to sound the great shofar, and then it continues. So sound the great shofar for our freedom, raise the banner to gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you Hashem who gathers in the dispersed of his people of Israel. So what great shofar are we talking about? To answer this question, we must go back to Breshi, Genesis, when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Yitzchak as Hashem had commanded him to do. Just as Abraham was ready, Hashem told him to stop, to look in the bushes where a ram was, was stuck. Instead of sacrificing his son, Abraham was instructed to sacrifice the ram. According to the Medrash in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, the two horns of this ram were left to be used for other purposes. The small left horn, shofar, was blown at Mount Sinai, at Har Sinai, um, at the time of the giving of the Torah, at Matan Torah. The larger right horn shofar will be blown by God, by Hashem, when it is time to redeem the exiles of Israel. This then is the great shofar that we speak about three times a day in the weekday Amida. So the following is an interesting concept that I read about, presented by a principal in Atlanta, Georgia, named Rabbi Abraham Tekach. Going back to um, the sacrificing of Yitzchak, Akeda Yitzchak, Abraham was challenged, he was challenged to bring Yitzchak as a sacrifice. Abraham was able to remove the personal barriers that would hold him back, and he reached into his inner self to do the will of God over his own. When he broke through the wall of personal challenge, then he found what he found near him was a ram. So this is an interesting concept of breaking through a wall, something I had never heard or thought about before. So other times the shofar was, other times the shofar was blown was on Yovel years, the Jubilee years, um, every 50 years when sla all slaves were set free. In Jubilee years, it is a mitzvah, it's a commandment to blow the shofar. Also, when the Jews entered the lands of Israel under the leadership of Yehoshua, Joshua, um, at the time of the Battle of Jericho, they circled the city seven times and blew the shofar. The walls fell down, allowing B'nai Israel to conquer the city. According to Rabbi Tekach, the common thread of the blowing of the shofar at the Jubilee time, when slaves are freed, and the blowing of the shofar at the Battle of Jericho, is that the sound of a shofar knocked down a wall. It took away barriers and led us through. The blast of the shofar signifies penetrating through, breaching outer barriers and reaching the inside. The shofar was blown at the time of the giving of the Torah. It was time for us to reach into our inner selves 
and break the external walls of temptation and challenges. We have struggles and we have strengths. Um, as individuals, if we can overcome our struggles and challenges, then as a nation, we will be stronger. Rabbi Takech writes in this article that Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luz uh, Luzato, a famous Italian rabbi, Kabbalist and philosopher from the 1700s, said that overcoming challenges is a way to achieve greatness. If a person can work on what is hard and improve, that person will be great. Um, Rabbi Takech continues by saying that we need the strength to overcome the challenges that we all have. The shofar reminds us to reconnect with our inner goodness and connection with Hashem. And then we will find the strength to overcome life's challenges. Can one imagine challenges greater than being enslaved as prisoners in concentration camps? Two true stories come to mind about how important hearing the shofar was in the concentration camps. It is impossible to imagine that people stripped of all their earthly goods could have pro procured a shofar in a concentration camp. Yet I found documentation of two, one which I'll talk about now and which, one which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I read in this article, um, again, it was, in the, it was in the New York Times in, last September and it was in, entitled, an improbable relic of Auschwitz, um, a shofar that defied the Nazis. Dr. Judith Tudor Schwartz, an expert on the Holocaust, who directs Holocaust research at Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel, said that, and I will now quote directly from an artic this article, which was written by Ralph Blumenthal, if it's one thing I know from the thousands of survivors I interviewed, it's that the impossible was possible, both to the bad and to the good. Some shofars likely arrived in Auschwitz in mid-1944 when the Hungarians were deported. Mr. Kligger from the Jewish Museum, who I, whom I mentioned at the beginning of this little talk, a child of Holocaust survivors, said he remembers hearing from a friend of his parents that a shofar had sounded in Auschwitz. Dr. Schwartz said her father was given the shofar by another prisoner as the Nazis prepared to flee in um, Auschwitz in 1945. Dr. Schwartz's father carried the shofar with him the rest of his life. Dr. Schwartz has loaned this special shofar to the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Manhattan as part of a traveling ex exhibition called Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. Hey, Ben, is gonna continue right now. So um, I think right now I'm supposed to talk about the sound of the shofar and what we blow, right? Right. So here is the shofar. I know you know what it looks like. A, let me just see myself. So here's the shofar. Um, I think it grows from the head kind of like this. So I guess the, the wide end is where it attaches to the head, I think. Now this, um, this one, uh, if you'd see here near the, so the narrow end, there's a hole in there. And this has been smoothed out, well, it's smoothed out inside and outside. The top of this chauffeur is, or the, the, is not that smoothed out. Most chauffeurs get smoothed out completely. This, you could still see the texture from the uh, from the horn. So um, interestingly, there's a halacha that if that it's a mitzvah, uh, doesn't mean in the case of literally a mitzvah, but it's better to use a, a, a horn that's bent than a, a straight chauffeur. Let's say if you would, I don't know if you'd make it from from here to here, and you made this be the the end and this was just straight, it's, you would fulfill your mitzvah, but it's better not to use uh, a shofar like that. And the reason is because we're supposed to feel bent over in a way of, um, of being not haughty. We have to, well, be, um, we should 
turn our our uh, our hearts to Hashem is the uh, the words that are used. So um, also, I think that uh, it is also a uh, a symbol to what tshuva. A lot of times in life, you want things to go straight from point A to point B. But how often do things really go from point A to point B? Not so often. So um, having a chauffeur that is bent reminds us that even though things aren't going straight, you can still direct them and position them and, but the most part, direct them to Hashem. So even if we did something wrong, we could do tshuva and we can, uh, the wrong word to use is straighten out because that's what we're talking about, it being crooked, but you can redirect even something which was going in the wrong direction to Hashem. So it's a good lesson for tshuva. So the shofar itself, you, it, um, it gets blown similar to um, a brass instrument like a trumpet or a trombone. Um, and, but differently than a trumpet and a trombone, they usually use uh, the front or they use the front of their mouth to make the sound on shofar we're supposed to blow out of the right side of our mouth. Um, the reason is it's a little bit strange. There's a Pusik in the book of Shoftim, book of Judges, that the Satan was on his right side to hinder him. I forgot who the him was at this point, but um, so therefore where it's on the right side to try to eliminate the negative uh, influence that is uh, bothering us and trying to prevent us from doing what we are supposed to do. So there's a very important and fundamental argument between Rashi and Tosvos about how many sounds uh, do we blow. So the shofar, it, whenever we blow a shofar, it is a broken sound. Uh, it's the shvarm and the trua, we'll talk about that. And it's always surrounded by a straight, unbroken sound, which we call a tekiya. So every sound of the shofar is tekiya, and then a broken sound, and then the tekiya again. There were two uh, different customs of what the broken sound sounded like. It was either the shvarim, which we, uh, well, I'll just blow it. It's either, or it's a faster, uh, a quicker, slower, uh, a, a, a quicker sound, the duration is much faster. And both of those have to do with crying but it's at different stages of the crying. And, uh, I also, it might also refer, they used to have uh, professional weepers, I think maybe in uh, Ireland, maybe they were called the uh, keeners, or they did keening, K-E-E-N, I think was the, the, the word. Uh, and they cried at funerals and stuff. So those are different sounds of, of the broken sound. So at some point, communities had a custom to blow the three longer sounds as the broken sound. And some communities had the custom to blow just the quicker sounds. Doo, 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 doo. And then some communities had a custom to do both. So in the time of the Gemara, Rabbi Abahu, and this is how uh, Rav Haigon explains it, uh, Rav, Rabbi Abahu wanted to unify the minhag even though each one of those ways of blowing the shofar is completely okay, he wanted everyone to blow uh, the same exact way. So he instituted that we will blow the tekiah, shvarim, tekiah, tekiah, and then the three, and we'll talk about the numbers in a moment, and then the tekiah, and, and each time we blow shofar, we need three of those, and then three tekiah, trua tekiahs, yeah, so a tekiah, the straight, unbroken sound, and then the very quick staccato, do, 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 and then a tekiah, so three of those, and then also a tekiah, and then the shvarm with the tekiah, the three longer notes and the three shorter notes sandwiched by tekiahs. So um, if we talk about beats, a there, this is where the important argument between Rashi and Tosfos uh, comes into play. According to uh, to 
uh, Tosvos, and this is the way uh, we follow his opinion, each uh, Shvarim is the length of of three Truos. So, and, um, and, and according to Tosvos, we would blow a Tekiya, and then three Shvarims, and then nine Truos, because the nine Truos are the same length and number of beats as the three Shvarim. So, according to um, to Tosos, it would be the middle beats would be something like. <laughs> And you can add on to the number of shvarms and the number of tekiyas, uh, but what's also an important thing is that the length of those should be the same as the length of the tekiyos that sandwich it. So uh, some uh, chauffeur blowers aren't so particular about that and they will blow a short tekiyah before or after, but according to the halacha, the tekiyah has to be the same length as what you're blowing in the middle, whether it's just so, when it's just a shvarim or just a trua, your tekiyos around that could be shorter, but when it's a shvarim and a trua, it, that takes a longer amount of time, so your tekiyah would have to be longer also. Now, according to Rashi, whose opinion we don't accept, a shvarim is the length of only two beats. And according to Rashi, if you have a shvarim that's three beats, that's a tekiyah because once it becomes a certain length, it would become a tekiah. So according to Rashi, we wouldn't fulfill uh, the, the way to blow the shofar the way that people primarily blow it. So um, because of that, I think some people blow shvarim, that's like a bending note. Um, one way of doing that sounds like this. So that's not a flat sound. It's not doesn't say this at the same pitch. So since it changes pitch, it can't be a uh, tekiya. When I was uh, uh, a child, uh, our chazan at Kesemar, Rabbi A. Aaron Siegel, he blew shvarms that were very uh, had a lot of change in pitch. It almost like do 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 do, and I think the reason that people blow shvarms like that is to uh, not run into the problem that, according to Rashi, a long shvarm would be a tekiah. So since they bend the notes, um, the, it's not a straight sound of a tekiah. So that's how they get around the problem. The way that we get around the problem, it was an idea that Ravaron Salvechik, uh, our Rav Moshe Salvechik's father's brother, so Rav Moshe's uncle, Rav Yosef Dov Salvechik, developed when he was a child. Uh, his grandfather, Reb Chaim Brisker, was very excited by the uh, by uh, his proposal. And what he proposed is, according, uh, we should blow more short shvarims, more short shvarims to get enough beats. Because according to Tosvos, you would need uh, you have three shvarims of three beats each. So that's a total of nine beats of shvarims. So he said that why don't we blow shvarms that are two beats, but let's blow five shvarms, because five times two is 10, you'll have enough, enough beats of a shvarm, and uh, and it won't be a problem of being a tekiah according to Rashi. So, so according to Rashi, so if the shvarams are two beats each, you would have five uh, shvarams and then uh, nine or more truos. And according to Tosvos, each shvarim is three beats long. Um, and this way is uh, the way that you have that you're blowing enough. Uh, beats according to Tosvos, but you don't have the problem of it being a tekiah according to Rashi. And that's uh, how I blow. That's why I blow extra shvarms because they're shorter shvarms than regular. So again, the way that I would blow from the beginning. <laughs> And 
and the trua if I blow just the shvarim. to hear nine sounds. A tekiya, shvarim, tekiya three times, but because of the different customs, that's why we talk about blowing uh, 30 uh, blasts, and that is uh, a tekiya, shvarim, trua, tekiya. We consider each of those um, four. The tekiya is one, the shvarim, however many shvarim you need is one, however many trues you need is one, and the tekiya, so you need that three times, so that's 12, and then tekiya, shvarim, tekiya, three times, that's another nine, and a tekiah trua tekiya is another nine, and that's the minimum you need to fulfill your Torah level uh, show for blowing, which is 30 sounds. And now I will um, pass it back to my mother to continue. Okay, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about a couple of chapters in Tehillim, in Psalms. Um, <coughs> the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, Psalm 47, Mem, Amem Zion, which begins, Lam Natseach Livnei Korach Mizmor. Um, and in this is the Psalm that we say in Shul seven times on Rosh Hashanah before the shofar gets blown. And I'm gonna quote when I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote this um, edition of the Tehillim that I have called the Raskin edition. It's a Lubavitch edition. Um, and it makes the following comments. Even though Hashem is the king of all people, um, as the chosen nation, it is our privilege to blow the shofar and daven for a year of peace and redemption for the entire world. We can compare what is happening on Rosh Hashanah to the coronation um, took the coronation of a king, where all of the princes and lords and dukes sing praises and shout. The king has ascended and sits on the throne on his royal chair as the king comes up to the throne. On Rosh Hashanah, we are celebrating the coronation of our king Hashem. Through our davening, tshuva, and shofar blasts, we hope to ensure that Hashem sits on a throne of mercy. We are hoping that Hashem will not judge each of us with the midah of deen of judgment, but with the midah of chesed, of kindness. The commentary describes this as a serious but joyful moment. According to this edition of the Tehillim in chapter 81, um, Pei Aleph of Tehillim, uh, it, was, it was composed um, to be sung on Rosh Hashanah to commemorate Hashem's salvations. What were the salvations that happened on this day in our calendar? On this day, Yosef, Joseph, was freed from jail. Years later, on the same date, the Egyptians stopped forcing B'nai Israel to do embarrassing labor for them. The commentary says that we too hope for a year of salvation from trouble. Boy, do we, right? Um, the commentary continues to say that Hashem speaks, speaks to us through the shofar. It blasts fills our hearts and help us to do teshuva, which is usually, um, usually translated as repentance. What is teshuva? Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs wrote an article 11 years ago called God's Alarm Clock, which you can find on h.com, a website, um, which this and some other articles I'm talking about um, come from. Um, and this article Rabbi Sachs said, Teshuva means not only repentance, but also retor returning to our roots, our faith, our people's history, and our vocation as heirs to those who stood at Sinai more than 3,000 years ago. Teshuva asks us, did we grow in the past year or did we stand still? Did we study the text of our heritage? Did we keep one more mitzvah? Did we live fully and confidently as Jews? Teshuva is our satellite navigation system, giving us direction in life. Rabbi Sachs also stated, 
knowing that none of us will live forever, we ask God for another year to grow, to pray, and to give. That is what Maimonides the Ramba meant when he called the shofar God's alarm, alarm call, asking us not to slumber through life, but to use it to bring blessings. In an article in the Jerusalem Post on August 26, 2009, writer Ruthie Blum Leibowitz interviewed Rebetzin Esther Jungreis of Blessed Memory, a well-known motivation speaker, columnist, and author. Rebetzin Jungreis, born in Hungary, was taken to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp as a child together with her family. Later, um, living in New York, um, she founded the Hineni organization which was devoted to encourage Jews to become closer to their heritage, roots, and the Torah. And in this article, the Rebetzin told this fascinating story, which I will quote directly. On Rosh Hashanah in Bergen-Belsen, through great sacrifice, we in the Hungarian compound obtained a shofar. Adjacent to us was the Polish compound. When they heard about this, they came to the barbed wire fence that separated us to make the blessing while we blew the shofar, shofar and the Germans came to beat them. Many years ago, I spoke in Neve Eliza in, in the Samaria, Shomron. It was right before Rosh Hashanah, so I told this story. Suddenly, a woman got up and started to cry. She said, Rebetzin, I was in the Polish compound that day. I was a little girl and my father was the rabbi there and your shofar was smuggled into our camp and I have that shofar. Immediately, she ran home and came back with the shofar, and we stood there crying like babies holding it and weeping. I said, how could this happen if not for God? That two little girls survived and are holding that shofar in the lands of Israel. It has to give you goosebumps. It has to make you see there's a God in the world. How could we be so blind? Am Israel has to wake up. It's not a question of being religious or secular. It's a question of understanding that we are a nation who stood at Mount Sinai and that, and that there is a God and that he is our friend. So to sum up some of the, what I found to be special points, um, Rabbi Tekach said, the blast of the shofar signifies penetrating through, breaching outer barriers and reaching the inside. We have strengths and we have struggles. As individuals, if we can overcome our challenges, then as a nation, we will be stronger. The shofar, which the Rambam calls God's alarm clock, according to Rabbi Sachs, asks us not to slumber through life, but to use it to bring blessings. Rabbitson Jungreich said, it has to make you see there's, there's, a God, there's God in the world. How could we be so blind? Am Yisrael has to wake up. It's not a question of being religious or secular. It's a question of understanding that we are a nation who stood at Mount Sinai and that there is a God and that he is our friend. Given the power of the shofar, it is no wonder that Mr. Kligger said, if there's an artifact that symbolizes the Jewish soul, you'd be hard pressed to find something more indicative than a shofar. And as the Chabaz Raskin edition of Tehillim commentary says, Hashem speaks to us through the shofar it blasts our hearts and helps us to do teshuva. That is an opportunity that we are best not to miss. So, um, Vance, Vance, do you want to unmute people, see if they have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Nobody has any questions? Okay, so now you can unmute yourselves. If you want. Thank you. It's a great presentation. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, what's the mother going to say? <laughs> I paid her to say that. I, I had my crib sheet. She didn't pay me, and it was great. It really was. It was nice. great. Thank I, you. I didn't pay you. Yeah. I'm a sucker for anything rabbits and young so. Okay, I'm glad I put her in then. <laughs> that was that, that was great. That okay, was, good. Thanks. And Bensi, ben, you know, we, we've often like wondered, was them a little shorter? Were there more of those? So that you answered many of our questions. Oh, good. okay. I'm glad. You, you both brought 
forth a lot of richness. I really appreciate hearing this. Thank you, Melissa. Hope you're doing well. Thank God. Good. I really Good. enjoyed it. It was a lot of those stuff I didn't know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Eleanor. Great Thank you. It's Thank exciting you, to be hearing what we evolve teaching. It really is. It's been too long. Very nice. Thank you. We're really